Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, and likewise. Uh, Mr Oppenheim, we um, were just dealing with the preamble to the first supplemental agreement, which was at Fujitsu 50485. And we had gone through the preamble, and I think we'd identified that there were some 15 um, outstanding um, faults, of which um, six or so were disputed. And can we go um, forwards, please, to page um, seven of this document, and look at the foot of the page. Can you see the heading at the bottom, rollout? Yes, I can. And then if we go over the page, please. The parties agreed in paragraph 4.1 that rollout should not commence until authorised by the Release Authorisation Board in accordance with paragraph 4 of Schedule A11. What was the Release Authorisation Board, please? This was a joint um, POCL, ICL Pathway Senior Management Group which was assembled to make the judgment about whether or not to roll out in the light of AIs and acceptance in general and anything else. Thank you. Uh, paragraph 4.2, notwithstanding uh, that, the parties agree to install the core system in additional outlets as follows. Um, 31st of August, Borough High Street, one uh, branch, then 60 branches by, uh, in the week commencing the 6th of uh, September, 90 branches in the week commencing the 13th of September. If by the 10th of September the parties agree that sufficient progress has been made in resolving the outstanding faults and any other outstanding category A or B AIs, the parties may agree to install the core system in further outlets as follows, and then down the page please. In the week commencing the 20th of September, uh, 158 branches and in the week commencing the 27th of September 178 branches yes agreed what would you um, say to the suggestion that uh, within a few um, weeks of the codified agreement being signed there had been a failure to sign off on the integrity of the core system and yet nonetheless there was a planned rollout at scale envisaged by this document. So, um, the, the driver for this primarily was to increase the sample size, the point that you made uh, <clears throat> at some point this morning, um, 200 was, was judged to be too small, plus there were incidents to do with, or AIs to do with uh, rollout itself. For example, training, uh, was it 218? Um, so these needed to be exercised. Now, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, this was too aggressive too soon, and indeed, as you'll show me in a moment, doubtless, um, that, was, that was swept away fairly swiftly. But the the whole process had started some time earlier, before the codified agreement. The codified agreement basically uh, codified, hence the term, I think, the Memorandum of Understanding, which was signed in, as I recall, the latter part of May. May. And that basically set the roadmap for all the things that had to happen, including the three-month uh, live trial. Um, otherwise it wouldn't have completed uh, in this time frame. So looking at the codified agreement in isolation, I agree, it looks like, you know, you signed this, you failed then, and still you're going to carry on. Um, but actually the wheels were set in motion quite some time previously. And in fact, the live trial was in play before DSS dropped out, which is why there was still a reference to the DSS in the acceptance incident form. Um, the, the, nature, the nature of the live trial changed and the focus is very much more on POCL. <coughs> now, uh, you know, as we recognised pretty quickly that this wasn't a sensible thing to do and we 
we agreed to change it. Without the benefit of hindsight, could you not see that this was a recipe for disaster, prematurely rolling out a system that wasn't ready? Well, if it hadn't been ready, then we wouldn't have uh, agreed to roll it out. We wouldn't have been allowed to roll it out, and we wouldn't have wanted to roll it out. Um, but the premise when this uh, supplemental agreement was put together was that a lot of progress had been made, and it had. I mean, the, uh, the AI we were looking at in detail before lunch showed that what appeared to be a very alarming state of affairs actually was, a, um, in respect to the pathway piece, a much smaller issue. That's not to belittle it and say it wasn't of any consequence at all. It was, but it didn't affect cash accounts. Uh, and so there was a belief that actually we were making good progress, and by this future date, um, we would be, uh, we stood a chance of, of being in a, in a good place to, to carry on, to increase the sample size and get more feedback. You've said um, on three occasions, I think, that the purpose of this was to increase the sample size. Is that right, that this was part of an extended exercise to broaden the test bed? Or was, in fact, this part of rollout? This wasn't part of rollout. This was... Um, this. You'll find references in various places about the need to do... to increase the size of the operational sample. Um, I can't pinpoint from memory exactly where those references are, but that was definitely part of the, part of the rationale. It wasn't just to push out a whole bunch of post offices uh, to hit the numbers early. In your statement, we needn't turn it up, um, it's paragraph 74, you say that once the change in commercial terms had been agreed with uh, Treasury as a result of the withdrawal of the benefits agency, both parties, that's um, ICL and POCL, were incentivized to proceed as quickly as possible. And you say in paragraph 104 that the agreement set an extremely tight timetable and at paragraph 146 that there was financial pressure on both Pathway and Pockle at the time of the rollout. Bearing those things in mind, uh, incentivization to proceed as quickly as possible, uh, an extremely tight timetable and financial pressure do you think the interests of sub-postmasters were suborned from the forefront of your company's mind at this time? I don't. Um, we readily accepted that we hadn't hit the hurdle that was required of us, and we continued to work on it, worked on it extremely hard, uh, together with PSCL. Um, there were things that weren't as they should have been, um, and they needed further work. Uh, you asked me a question about the incentives, and I answered it uh, honestly in the, in, in the answer. Yes, there were intense incentives. But at the same time, I think I also say the last thing we needed was, was a, another full start, given what had happened with the benefits agency. So our reputation had taken a, a hit because it was perceived by many as really down to us, to to have uh, failed in the production of the benefit payment card program. Thank you. That um, document can be taken down and replaced with Fujitsu triple zero seven nine one nine six, please. Fujitsu triple zero seven nine one seven six. Yes, Fujitsu triple zero seven nine one seven six. Thank you. Uh, we can see that this um, is a record of an um, acceptance workshop held on the um, 17th of September 1999 
And so over a month after the previous AI forms that we had um, uh, looked at before lunch, uh, can you tell us what an acceptance workshop was, please? So the acceptance workshop, there was a, a workshop which was overarching, chaired by Keith and myself, uh, and within it, each of the AIs was addressed. And that, that process, which was written in, I think, to the supplemental agreement, or was it in the, yes, in the supplemental agreement, was, was that we work, would work jointly through these various issues. Um, we can see you're present at this one. And um, it's chaired by Peter Copping as expert from PA. Yes. We can see that you're present at this one in yes. the fourth line. Yes. And the way that this works is that it addresses AI by AI, uh, page by page. Correct. Um, I wonder, therefore, um, we can go forward to page six, please. I think at the foot of the page, you can see the heading A376 to AI376, data integrity. Yes, indeed. And would that be a, um, a fair way of describing the issue uh, with AI376, that it was an issue of the integrity of the data? Yes, it's a fair way to express it. And then if we go over the page, please. And then just scroll down a little bit, please. We can see um, a description in this on this page of a series of workshops. Are they um, references to previous workshops that have occurred? Yes. Okay, and then if we go over the page, please. That's to page eight. Thank you. And again, a reference to further workshops in relation to a different aspect of AI 376. Yes? Mm -hmm. And then over the page, please, to at page nine. And if we scroll down a little bit, please. Uh, we see this recorded. Pockle's position is that rollout should not commence until data integrity can be assured. Ruth Holleran, do you remember who she was? Yes. Uh, who was she? She was um, certainly on the Pockle side. I think operational. Uh, to consider with the auditors and report back to this group whether the current pathway checks plus possibly continuing pockle checks would be adequate until pathways full data integrity checks are in place. Then skip over the reference, if we may, to the uh, previous workshops and come up to um, workshop seven, which is this workshop. Uh, workshop seven update. This issue has now focused on the success criteria for NRO resumption, uh, national rollout resumption? Correct. At the review in November, Pathway had previously proposed four weeks with um, equal to or less than 1.5% error rate. Do you remember that having been proposed by Pathway? To be honest, I don't. I mean, I see it there recorded, but I don't remember it. It's not certainly something that we spend a lot of time talking about. Why didn't you spend a lot of time talking about it? Because POCL rejected it, and I wasn't going to argue with them. Why was it suggested? I mean, on a, an estate of 20,000 branches, that would be, what, 300 branches a, a week showing a um, discrepancy error? Uh, yeah, but the... the this would have been um, on the basis that there would have been continuing improvements after that. That would have been a premise made. That rather than, than roll out from here, you'd roll out when you get down to here, and then there would be continuing improvements. 
That would have been the premise behind that, not that it would have stayed at less than 1.5 percent or a limit of 1.5 percent forever. I, I agree with you, it would have been too high, and indeed the previous pinnacle had acknowledged that such a thing would have been too high. Given that the previous pinnacle had um, acknowledged that a rate, <coughs> an error rate of this <coughs> would be too high, why was Pathway even suggesting it? I can't remember who suggested it. Um, uh, at a guess, it would have been put forward by uh, the lead um, analyst responsible for 376, but I can't remember whether that was John Pope or John Dix directly. Um, it's not something I recall having had any great discussion about. It, Bear in mind, these were, these were going on a pretty much a daily basis, and I did have other duties as well. Uh, Ruth Baines and Ruth Holleran proposed an error rate of 0.6%. The current average is 1.2%, together with six other conditions, five of which are listed in Ruth Holleran's paper, and the sixth being a further two-week period of live running of the permanent cash account fix prior to the actual recommencement of national rollout in January. And then you're recorded as responding as follows. The 0.6 error rate uh, was agreed, subject to this being measured as the average of six weeks from the 4th of October to um, mid-November. What would you say to the suggestion that this was conscious risk-taking here? accepting even an error rate of 0.6 percent. Yeah, but this is this is an error rate of the, the type that we were talking about before lunch, whereby you could get a missing attribute and, and a tip mismatch. Not that cash accounts, 0.6 percent of cash accounts were wrong. That's not what this was. So what was the worst consequence of the um, error. It would, I mean, the third supplemental agreement sets it all out as to under what failure conditions, what actions would be required. But the generality was that either pathway, most often pathway, but otherwise Pockle would have to make certain error corrections, um, either manually uh, into an, uh, you know, key them into the system to correct a, an imbalance, uh, some missing data, or otherwise, if there were a lot of them, then Pockle could require Pathway to provide an update file electronically. So that's all set. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, yes, that's all set out later. But that that was the consequence. It was to do with um, overwhelming. Pockle, but not only Pockle pathway in terms of the number of errors that we needed to be corrected. Can we see how um, this was formalised in the second supplemental agreement and turn up um, FUJ 00079316? Can you see um, this is a document called the second supplemental um, agreement dated the 24th of um, September and one of the things it does as we'll see is reduce into contractual terms what was agreed at, at that part of the workshop that we have um, we've just seen can we um, look again at the preamble please um, the second supplemental agreement is supplemental to the codified agreement uh, the contractor and Pockle have been carrying out the operational trial and the other acceptance procedures in accordance with the codified agreement by a supplemental agreement dated the 20th of August 99, the first supplemental agreement, the parties agreed that uh, the core system requirement acceptance had not been achieved at the end of the CSR operational trial period. By the first supplemental agreement, the parties agreed a programme of work with a view to achieving acceptance and release authorisation by the 24th of September, and also agreed that only certain elements of the CSR were uh, required to be resubmitted for testing in the second CSR acceptance test, and that only certain faults could be raised as acceptance incidents in relation to the second CR, CSR acceptance test. As at the date of this second supplemental agreement, the following 
um, acceptance incidents uh, remain outstanding. That excludes um, category C ones. Um, category um, B faults, they're described in uh, part A, and I think we'll find that's blank. And then um, faults not falling within um, recital E above, acceptance described in um, part B of um, schedule one, And I think we'll find that at page nine. So this is a list of the AIs that have rectification plans, and we can see that 376 is one of them. Can we go back to page three of the document, please? And at paragraph 3.1, we can see the contractor, that's um, ICL, undertakes to use its reasonable endeavours to resolve each of the outstanding acceptance incidents referred to in Part B of Schedule 1, which we just looked at, in accordance with the rectification plans listed in Schedule 2 and the rectification um, uh, timetable. Uh, Pockle shall use its reasonable endeavours to comply with the obligations imposed upon it in the rectification plans. Can we go forward to the rectification plans, please? They're page 10. We'll see that there is a list of rectification plans for each of the AIs. They're called AI ends here. Is that just AI number? You know, I'm not sure. When I read this, I couldn't recall what the end stood for. Uh, can we go forwards then to pick up the one that we're interested in, which is on page 13? And down the page to paragraph 20. And at 20.1 and 20.2, we can see the rectification plan for um, AI376. Each of the contractor and Pockle should complete the steps and achieve the objectives applicable to it, set out in document and it's uh, described. And where that document identifies one party as fulfilling an action, the other party shall assist the aforementioned party to reach a successful conclusion. Each of the um, uh, contractor and Pockle shall complete each of the obligations applicable to it by the dates and to the standards set out um, in um, another document. Can we go um, to page 19, please? For the rectification timetable at the foot of the page, Schedule 4, Part B, keep going down, we can see the TIP Interface Accounting Integrity, AI, AI376. And then if we um, flip over the page, or we'll carry on scrolling, thank you, we can see the timetable and the steps are as follows. Um, the criteria to be met by the 24th of November 1999 shall be as follows. During the period from 3rd of October until the 14th of November 1999, the percentage of cash accounts received by Pockle across the TIP interface containing cash account discrepancies shall not exceed 0.6% of all such um, accounts. That's essentially reducing into writing what had been agreed at the workshop, is that right? Yes. During the period 3rd of October until 14th of November 1999, no cash account discrepancy shall arise of a cause previously reported to Pockle as having been remedied. Um, that, that, that's obvious what it means on its face. All um, causes of cash account discrepancies um, identified after the date of this agreement shall have uh, been previously, uh, sorry, properly analysed by the contractor and suitable rectification plans, therefore, submitted to Pockle in reasonable detail within 10 days of the contractor becoming aware of such account discrepancy. Um, and then Roman 4, the contractor shall have satisfied Pockle, Pockle acting reasonably, that the accounting integrity control release would, had it been deployed at the relevant time, have identified all cash account discrepancies reported prior to 24th of November 1999, which will have arisen as a result of any new cause identified after the date of the agreement. 
and no need to read um, Roman 5. The reference to the Accounting Integrity Control Release. Can you explain what that is, please? So, um, this was to basically um, enhance the controls and the checks uh, three-way between uh, the counter, TMS, and TIP, as I recall. So it's, I think, otherwise known as three-way integrity check. <clears throat> because, as I have said before, that there's the possibility of timing differences. If a post office isn't polled, if, if the communication network goes down, then you have transactions at the post office that don't get to TIP, basically. They'll catch up in the next period, but in that period, they're missing. So <clears throat> you needed a mechanism to do that reconciliation such that you wouldn't have a situation where TIP simply said, it's wrong. What I've got is, is wrong. So first thing was to identify the discrepancies, and next it was to aid the process of fixing the, the discrepancies. Um, the okay. so the so-called um, rectified. Uh, uh, sorry, you were going to say. Um, we'll come back to the accounting integrity control release. That's a sufficient description at okay. the moment, and I'll uh, um, ask some questions in a little while about firstly whether it should have been there from the start, and um, secondly um, uh, whether it was an adequate remedy when it was, was introduced. Okay. Before we just leave this agreement, um, can we? Go back to page four, please. And look at 3.6 at the top. Uh, the contractor shall cooperate <coughs> and join with Pockel in providing such information and explanation to the post office's auditors, as such auditors may reasonably require in order to satisfy themselves that the audit reports of post office and Pockel should not be qualified or contain a fundamental uncertainty paragraph as a result of the circumstances giving rise to acceptance incident 376. Can you explain, please, why that was necessary? Uh, my recollection of this is hazy. I don't recall having to spend a great deal of time on it. Um, the, the point was that obviously there were uh, people within Pockle who were very concerned at 376, and that initial description of 376, which painted a very um, a black picture of, of likelihood of a lot of errors. As we discovered as we went through it, um, th there weren't uh, a significant number of errors arising from the system that would have affected cash accounts, but at that time it wasn't, that wasn't known, and there was a lot of concern. Plus, there were instances which could affect the cash account, notably, and in particular, around reference data. So, basically, people had got understandably concerned about it, and we were requested to provide, if you like, substantiating evidence you know, of the kind that I'm trying to convey now to show that the auditors that it wasn't going to be a disaster. Because otherwise, um, there would have to have been a qualification entered into the accounts, or the auditors may have required a qualification to be entered into that is, the accounts. That is indeed what uh, what they were concerned about, which I could well understand. Can we turn, uh, moving the story on a little, to um, Fujitsu uh, 00118169. Fujitsu 00118169. This is a monitoring report um, dated the 9th of uh, November 1999. You can see that in the bottom right at the foot of the page. And it's um, an update for the meeting the next day, the 10th of November. You can see that in the top right. Can you see that? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. And then against the, um, the third row, AI... Um, 371 slash 1, which was essentially the first requirement that required to be fulfilled that we've just mentioned in the rectification timetable. 
namely the percentage of cash accounts containing discrepancies, shall not exceed 0.6%. I think we can see the, um, the figures were where the target was not exceeding 0.6%. For the week of the 3rd to the, or the period, for the 3rd to the 6th of October, it was just shy of 45%. Yep, correct. For the period the 7th to the 13th of October, it was just shy of 43%. For the 14th to the 20th of October, it was 32%. And then the 21st to the 27th of October, it was... 2.29 percent. Can you recall what accounted for the um, firstly the substantial um, reduction? Well, I can <coughs> I can describe what caused the very high numbers, and that was bad reference data. It was all down to the reference data. Well, not all, but something like two percent would have been would have been other things, but all the rest of it was I believe was reference data. The vast bulk of that was reference data, and it was acknowledged to be by pocket at the time. So you had signage problems that we alluded to earlier. So a 196 reference data update, which um, we had challenged in June, and we were instructed again in October to apply, even though we had said we thought it was likely to create a problem, and it duly did. And it, actually, in one of the documents I've seen, I've seen an acknowledgement that, that, yes, that's exactly what did happen. That was one example. There were other examples. Reference data was a major problem. When the, um, that stripped out, and we get to the week of the um, 21st of October to the 27th of October, the um, figure is still no, nearly four times the um, so-called acceptable level of cash account discrepancies, isn't it? It is, and I'm not saying that that wasn't the tale of reference data. It could have that been. could be reference data too. It, some of it could be. I really can't analyze it. All, all I can say, and you may show me a later version of this, a, a later dated version of this, um, is that by the end of the period, we were either at or very close to the 0.6%, having stripped out these uh, non-data errors, as we referred them to the mass. Can we um, go forwards, please, to Fujitsu 000 58187? Uh, this is a monthly um, uh, progress report. I think, um, is this from ICL2? Yeah, this is... This is our. Two pop. This, this is ours. It's with. It's internal, and it's also to pop. Yes. And you would have either um, seen or contributed to the creation of this. I would have seen it. I wouldn't have contributed. Okay. Um, can we go forward to page ten, please? And um, have a look at the third bullet point. Um, too many reference data errors are being distributed to the counter. End-to-end -end design reviews are being held to establish what action could be taken swiftly to prevent these occurring in the future. They're having a major impact on AI376. In addition, the performance of the data distribution process is inadequate and must be improved before rollout commences in late January 2000. So this is October 99, when we see the reference to too many reference data errors. What does the um, last sentence mean? The performance of the data distribution process is inadequate and must be improved. So um, this, is, this is where we have to get reference data updates out to every counter and every branch before the change in reference data is to take effect. And as I said before, this was before uh, internet and broadband, this, we had to do that using IBM's Tivoli system, which was state-of-the-art at the time, over ISDN. And the challenge was to be able to get all of these instructions out uh, well in advance, like two days or so in advance of when they were due to take effect, 
so that there wouldn't be any mistakes. Can we go forward to page 19 of the document? Um, under detailed plan activities and the acceptance resolution timetable, and then scroll down. Next to each bullet point is the number of the AI. And can we look at what um, John Pope, I think that is, said in relation to um, 376? John Pope, this area is of particular concern. The six-week observation period has started. The work is in three parts. Fixes yielding a target stability figure um, of merit of a maximum 0.6% of cash accounts in error, approximately 42, additional reconciliation facilities, and a new business, um, operational business change procedures. Although all fixes are implemented, problems arising from pathway reference data handling were encountered and are proving difficult to solve without letting through cash, er cash accounts in error. The definition work for additional reconciliation is on plan and design is in progress all the OBC procedure work is completed, and we can um, stop there. So again, at this point, um, the finger being pointed towards reference data being the problem. wasn't the only problem. I mean, <laughs> this is a very, very complex multi-layer program. So it's, I, I don't want to give the impression it was the only problem, but it was the overwhelmingly largest problem. Um, but as it says there, we, we had issues also with um, pathway reference data handling. That's when um, we received the path, the, sorry, the reference data instructions from Pockle. We then needed to handle it, in, in inverted commas, turn it around and push it out to the post offices. And we were having trouble with that, probably just the volume of that. But Can we that's what that alludes to. Thank you. Can we move to a similar progress report for January 2000? Um, Fujitsu 0058189. Can see the date, similar um, format to before. Can we go forwards, please, um, to page 26? Uh, the first bullet point at the top of the page, the outturn on AI376 was 0.06 cash account discrepancies. Um, exactly an order of magnitude better than the target. Obviously, 0.06 better than the target of 0.6. Under this activity, John P. John Pope made significant contributions to the third supplemental agreement specified um, the committed CS repair uh, for facility, aligned the operating agreement on reconciliation to support the contract, and sorted out the necessary pinnacles um, uh, to clear. Th this reads as if um, it's a job well done, and that's the end of the matter. Is that right? No. It's a job well done, but it certainly wasn't the end of the matter. Um, Why wasn't it an end of the matter? Because we needed the detailed processes that were then written into the third supplemental agreement and subsequently um, operational documents that, that flow from that. Um, so that the fact that he had made significant contributions to an agreement that, what was the date of this? January 2000. I mean, the third supplemental agreement from memory was signed on the 19th, so I don't know whether this was before or after. It's not. It's just dated January 2000. But, 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 um, but in any event, the, the work that went into that was very, very significant. Uh, can we look forwards then, please, to the um, uh, statistics? Um, can we just look back a moment at uh, poll 309590? Can we see an email here at the foot of the page? Dated the 6th of January 2000. 
in advance of tomorrow's delivery meeting, please find attached the latest spreadsheet that looks at criteria in relation to 376. And then the thing that we're looking at, um, 3761, a 0.17% um, pass rate. So cleared the um, ceiling of 0.6%. And we see what happened to that by the time of the undated report that we have just read. How far had the um, accounting integrity control release contributed to this? Um, I don't know for sure, but I would say it was a major contributing factor. The accounting integrity control release, um, can we um, understand how it was intended to operate <coughs> um, in um, practice and the function that it was intended to um, perform? It set out, and this is just for the transcript, it's, um, no need to turn it up, in the second supplemental agreement at poll triple zero nine oh four two eight at pages one hundred and thirty five to one hundred and thirty seven a document entitled logical design for epos stroke tip reconciliation controls I want to try and understand how um, in simpler language rather than going through that laboriously it um, functioned and the operation that it was intended to uh, perform would this be right, that um, the EPOS and transaction information processing tip reconciliation controls added some functionality to the system to provide a simple validation that the transactions and data recorded at the counter match the data in the POCL back-end systems? Exactly right. That's a, that's a good high-level summary, yes. And the um, way in which the um, data and transactions were captured and harvested, in broad summary again, works as follows. And this is me and my understanding translating uh, what has been read. Um, firstly, the EPOS, the electronic point of sale service transaction data from the counter was captured in something called the Office Platform uh, Service Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The data is harvested by the Transaction Processing Service, that's a POCL database, collecting all transactions from the counters. It's passed to TIP, the Transaction Information Processing, which would in turn feed POCL accounting systems. Um, you're asking me to confirm something that's a little perhaps too technical for me. I mean, I was very happy with what you said previously. As the high-level summary, but not the I, I'm not 100% sure that it worked like that. My understanding was the harvesting was done um, from branches to correspondence servers to TMS to TIP. So that was the route that I was familiar with. And then once within TIP, then post office would push that same data out to clients and there would be reconciliations between them and okay. clients. Okay, let's look at it a different way around, um, <coughs> looking at the um, object. The object is to ensure that the transaction records from the counter, which are then subsequently transferred by TPS and TIP to POCL, um, to their accounting systems, reconcile exactly. So... To be precise, yes, but to be precise, TIP is a POCL system. Yes. So that's the boundary. TMS, TIP is the boundary. Now, the accounting integrity control release introduces, would you agree, some basic checks to ensure that on a, week, on a daily and then on a weekly basis, an, a certain number of things um, collected at counter level match that that was transferred by TIP. Transferred to TIP, I would think. Yes. To and then by TIP. Yes, correct. Uh, firstly, the total number of transactions. Yes, and Se the value. Secondly, the quantity value of them. And thirdly, the sales value of them. Time they're, right, yes. They're the three um, basic um, data checks that the 
uh, control release intends to collect and compare. Yes. And so this new release was intended to ensure that those three data sets collected at the counter level matched that data that was transferred via TIP. That's my understanding, yes. And then if the output is that um, is such that the numbers don't match, it generates an alert, essentially. It does, yes. And what it generates is identification of the branch code and the discrepancy figures are reported, i.e. what the discrepancy on any one of those data sets that I mentioned is. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's my understanding. Would you agree that from um, a technical perspective that would have required in this new release, firstly ensuring that a clear marker was used to delineate the start and end time period used? You're asking me for a technical view. I mean, there were start times in all of the messages, and indeed this was one of the reasons for the you know, a missing attribute problem that we talked about earlier. So we'll, on occasion, we'll pick, that we'll pick got it up missed. with another witness. Um, yeah, I, I'd rather you did. Yes. Why was a system of this nature carrying out rather basic data integrity controls not built in from the start? It's a very fair question. Um, there was an element of it before. This didn't suddenly get rustled up in no time at all. So we'd been working on it, um, I think, since about June, recognizing that there would be a need, <clears throat> which is how it was that it was possible to deliver it for December. Um, Can I suggest I don't think there was a requirement from Pockle for it. I don't recall a requirement. Who out of uh, the pair of you in this relationship were the IT experts? We both were. They, they had a lot of technical people on their side. And so in your last two answers, are you suggesting that it fell to them to suggest that a very basic validation and reconciliation tool should be written into your software code? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm simply saying... In answer to your question, um, why wasn't it done sooner? I think there was a, a, an element of it before. And in fact, I can recall a couple of pinnacles talking about there were, I can't remember what they were. There were checks, but they weren't organized in the manner that you described. And they were more for technical people. Uh, so they weren't as usable and they weren't as shareable, as it were, with, with Pockle. So, yeah, logically, I agree. Um, I don't think that it was in a requirement, and therefore it got missed. I'm not going to make any Can I turn to a, a related issue? Whether this um, uh, very basic software, as I um, described it, was capable of identifying and addressing <laughs> the underlying root causes of the cash imbalances that it detected would you agree that the capability of the software release, as we've just described it, was quite limited? Yes. Um, that's because all the release did was to flag batches of transactions that didn't recognize, uh, reconcile. Uh, individual transactions, it would pinpoint uh, those which uh, did not match that three-way check. It, uh, but it wouldn't, of itself, identify the root cause, correct? Exactly. Um, that, that was the point I was about to make. It wasn't capable <coughs> of identifying the root causes of the cash account imbalances, let alone address the root causes. Absolutely right. What it did do, and there was a process for this, very detailed processes, it, when the, whenever one of these um, exception events was identified, then there was a routine for looking into the transaction logs, the message files, and so on and so on, to, to, uh, to dig into, uh, you know, what had caused the problem. The, the, the second limitation, would you agree, was that even if um, the release worked properly, it would only highlight 
a specific set of errors in the system related to harvesting and communication of transactions between the counter and tip. I agree with you. And so that if there was a software or hardware fault at the counter level that um, itself prevented transactions from being recorded or lost or duplicated or miskeyed in EPOS, for example, uh, they wouldn't be captured by this release. I think I need to, if you don't mind, go into each of those in turn because they're slightly different. Yes. I agree that the headline principle of what you're saying. It wouldn't have addressed those. It would have addressed timing differences and, and such like mismatches in communication. What it wouldn't have done is identified if there'd been uh, a break in the network right in the middle of a transaction such that something was lost. Now, there should be messages right up until that point, and it should be possible to see that... Um, the counterclock had got to a certain point in the transaction. Uh, so, for example, a, a possible reason for a cash discrepancy, a shortfall, would be there had been a benefits payment made, the cash had been paid out, and then, lo and behold, the transaction wasn't recorded. That would be an obvious cause for there being a discrepancy and a shortfall for the postmaster. Now, by analysing the messages right, right up until the point where there would be a record of the break in the network, you would be able to see that, yes, you got to this point, but the receipt hadn't been printed or whatever, and it hadn't been completed, the transaction hadn't been closed out, as it would normally have to be. The inference of that, we would say, is that transaction actually did complete, the money was paid out, and the correction would be to fill in the blanks, as it were. And that would be the correction I would expect my technical colleagues to apply in this, in this uh, it was referred to in the previous thing, this, the, these um, um, rectification files. And they would be transferred across TIP and everything would balance if it was caught before it was uh, identified. And if not, we would send an error correction afterwards. I'm going off memory for, for uh, the third supplemental agreement. But so, so that's one cause of failure. Another cause of failure is, uh, let's say, a printer breaks or more likely it runs out of paper in the middle of a transaction. Now, I think that was fixed. I'm pretty sure that was fixed such that uh, the, the transaction would have completed anyway. But the, in the early stages, if that happened, then it would not. I believe that was a pinnacle that, that, that was resolved. So that's another one. Um, there's, there was the hourglass problem, which you haven't mentioned, but, but let me mention it. Slow running of the, the PC. Yes. Very understandably, a postmaster would get impatient. He's up against it. He's got a queue. And he might hit, I've done it myself, the key twice. If you hit the key twice, then basically um, that breaks that transaction, or it did at the outset. I believe that too was rectified, but at the beginning, that kind of involuntary behavior could cause a transaction to be either missed or duplicated. I can't recall. Um, Is the point this, Mr. Oppenheim, the um, release... Um, identified at a basic level a basic data set showing discrepancies, it neither identified nor addressed the root causes of them. And the only way properly to do so, to identify, diagnose, and deduce root causes, is to have a task force of skilled individuals doing so. I wouldn't say a task force, but you need skilled in a team of skilled individuals who do that for a living, yes. And that's what second and third line was supposed to be about. Now, just, just stopping you there, yeah. the help desk, that's what the help desk was supposed to be about, was it the second and third line? Help desk, when, when there's, the, the help desk would register the fact there'd been an error. And if there was a correction routine, that, uh, which um, it was possible for the postmaster to run for himself, then there should have been a script which had been agreed with, with Pockle 
that would steer the help desk first line operator would steer the postmaster through it such that he could affect that fix himself. I don't know the proportion of those that could be done that way. There was certainly quite a high proportion that could be done that way. Obviously, it relies on the postmaster uh, making the call, picking it up, and being able to follow through. And I know there were some instances where that went wrong, and then it was unable to put it right afterwards from what I've read. Uh, can we move, um, please, to the third supplemental agreement? Um, F. UJ double zero double one eight one eight six. Uh, this was entered into, we can see it on the top of the page there on the 19th of January um, 2000. And overall, would you agree that it defines at a relatively high level? the measures that were to be implemented to detect, report and remedy um, cash account errors by various issues, including um, software faults, coding errors, reference data errors? I wouldn't quite characterize it like that. It, it is actually quite detailed. Um, and it went into this table of, of, I think, all the known reasons for error at the time. And it wasn't, it wasn't so much to do with software errors. I mean, there was a process for that. This was not to do with software errors. It was identifying, OK, was it a one of these or one of those? And it set it out in very, so, very sorry, clear just terms. Stop, stop. Somebody's drawing something to my attention. Sure. Sorry? Okay, the transcript has stopped, so we better stop speaking. I suggest that we um, take early our afternoon break and restrict it to um, 10 minutes or so. I haven't got long to go in my, um, the rest of my examination, uh, but if we came back at 10 past three. Yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. Bye. Hello. So good afternoon. Um, sorry, that's taken um, a little longer than expected, um, 15 right. minutes rather than um, uh, than 10. But just before we pick up, Mr. Oppenheim, um, where we left off in the third supplemental agreement, um, just two um, clarificatory points on um, some questions that I asked and answers that you gave earlier. Um, firstly, could we have back up on the screen Fujitsu triple zero five eight one eight nine? This was one of the monthly reports, and I've picked the January 2000 monthly progress report. Um, I think, um, looking back at the transcript, in your answer, you said that this document was ICL's, i.e. it was authored by ICL, ICL Pathway, um, that it was internal, and then you added, but it's also to Pockel. Can I... In the, in um, the first... Sorry, I was just yeah. going to say it was, in a sense, both. I wasn't trying to say, oh, and by the way, it was also Pockle. On what basis do you say that this report was addressed to and provided to Pockle? I believe it was. I believe it was. I'm not 100% sure now that I think about um, it. What is the basis for your belief? Uh, it, was, it was my recollection. I can't say for certainty. Uh, if you bring up the distribution, could you do that? Um, I don't think I can. Um, if you look over the page. Uh, I haven't got it in front of me. Yeah. Oh, there. Right. One can see uh, a contents page. And then go over the page again. And then go over the page again. Uh, we always find these pages upside down and then go over the page again. Yes.
sometimes within these reports, one. Oh, I'm sorry. That I was referring to a service one. This is the managing directors. No, I got that wrong. I, I, if I may retract that, I thought we were looking at um, at the um, acceptance incident report, not this one. No, this this the managing directors is is internal. My apologies. Thank you. That's the first clarification. The second um, clarification, um, you said a number of times in the course of your evidence um, today um, and including this morning that the um, cash account, um, I, I'm going to call it capital C, capital A, was um, um, acceptable, was fine, and that this was one reason why it was permissible to seek to recategorize AI376 um, as a Category B um, incident or, or lower. When you're referring to the cash account here, are you referring to it as a, um, in a technical sense, to a technical module as part of the system? Uh, I'm struggling to understand yes. the point, I'm sorry. I've been using the cash account problem um, describing the cash account in a much broader context, i.e. Um, anything which showed a discrepancy between the um, cash that a sub-postmaster had in branch and the cash value recorded in um, back office systems. Right. Okay. Which um, I had understood the um, AI376, the two, certainly the first two incident forms to be referring to it in the sense that I was using those words, cash account discrepancy. Right, okay. Very important point. Um, the, I have to say mine is the narrower one, which is more of a technical one, I guess. Um, and if we go through um, aspects of the third supplemental agreement, I can point you to how we sought to distinguish between the two. Not to belittle the part that it would not identify, but it was never going to identify everything. All it was going to do was identify any differences between the cash account as declared by the sub-postmaster, the postmaster, what was um, in the central TMS system and what was sent across to TIP. The cash account as committed by the sub-postmaster may have been quote-unquote wrong, and, and I don't use the term in a purgative sense. It's what he may have been forced pretty much to commit to in order to carry on because there was an inadequate facility for him to say, just a minute, I've got a problem. If something didn't balance, and if he made good the imbalance, as I understand it, particularly in hindsight, then the committed cash account would have balanced and we would have known nothing about it. The only way we would have known about it is if he'd reported the problem to the help desk, which is what I was talking about before the break. In which case, if he says, look, I put through a such and such and it broke, you know, I gave a couple of examples, there are, there are more. Uh, and it didn't complete properly, and I've now, I, I'm pretty sure I've been through my records, and this £300 discrepancy, I can relate to that transaction, then um, we, the, from the help desk, should have gone into that and got a second-line support person, an account specialist, to go in, look at the, the message store and dig out the, the audit trail for that particular Event. And just stopping there, that requires the people in the help desks, the various tiers of the help desk, to do what you've just said. Yes. Um, for the sub postmaster to have um, persistence and a conviction in what they are saying um, and not to be told um, it's your responsibility to balance the books, uh, make good the difference. Uh, Certainly looking at what's happened, yes. Um, it shouldn't have required persistence. It should have required simply an explanation of what had been observed. And there should have been, as I said before, 
a certain amount that he could have done to put it right for himself through a scripted set of instructions. Bear in mind, the, the help desk person couldn't actually get to the terminal in the post office. That wasn't possible in those days. So he had to steer the sub-postmaster through what he would have had to do. And some of that would have been quite complicated, and I can imagine some of it, well, I've seen some of the evidence, some of it went wrong, and you ended up with double the problem that there was in the first place. So the only way to identify and fix those was through that route. This reconciliation process, you're quite right, would not have done that. Thank you. And, and if I may, just one more point. The third supplemental agreement made that clear because it said there's a thing, it, it identified a thing, called, I think sub, the second one did as well, a not data error, which sounds like a very peculiar term, but it's a very deliberate term. In pathways terms, it means it's not us. It's reference data is one example, or it's the postmaster making a mistake. I have to say that. Yeah. Easily done, millions of transactions, right? But it isn't something that's a software bug, and it's not something that we can affect, and it's not something we can fix. And there are references in there to, if it's not clear, we will say it's not clear, we will report that to the post office. Thank you. I'm just going to give the cross-reference to that. It's Fujitsu 000 H186. Um, we will chase down in due course um, the paragraphs within the third agreement. I know that you've been reading it or rereading it yeah. um, over the break. Yeah. Lastly, can I um, ask you please to look at Fujitsu 0011-8188, please. Thank you very much. Um, this is um, a letter from your counterpart, Keith Baines, um, dated the 20th of March 2000. Um, it reads, um, tip integrity checking. The second supplemental agreement in clause 7.1 provided for a tip integrity checking period during which Pockel would reconcile transaction and cash account data received in tip from ICL Pathway. This period was to continue until four consecutive weeks without discovery of any cash account discrepancies not found by the accounting integrity control release. I'm pleased to be able to confirm that this condition has now been satisfied with satisfactory explanations having been received by, Co by Pockle from ICL Pathway for the small number of apparent discrepancies uh, that were found. Um, I think this has been drawn to your attention very recently. Um, uh, and I don't suppose you remember re uh, receiving it at the time. Uh, that's my file. Yes. Writing at the top. Yes. But now you wouldn't remember receiving it. Uh, what do you now take from it, having um, had your attention drawn to it? Well, it doesn't surprise me. I think I do remember it because it was a ah. key, a key event. Um, but uh, th thankfully, you were able to produce it. Um, this was very important because. Obviously, if you go back to where we were in July, August, it, it was not looking good. Um, but by this stage, by doing this, and there was also the attribute checker, which you haven't mentioned, but yes. which we also put in place to help pop up with the reference data issues, um, we, we had done it. Um, I mean, but having said that, there were still inevitably going to be instances where something went wrong. And we've, we, I tried to write that into the third supplemental agreement. And Pockle should have known that. Thank you very much, Mr. Oppenheim. They're the only questions I ask um, at the moment. I think, sir, the next set of questions are to be asked by Mr. Jacobs on behalf of the How and Co. core participants. Thank you, sir. Could I ask if you can see me and hear me? I can hear you, and I now am able to see you as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Oppenheim, I'm asking questions on behalf of 153 sub-postmasters represented by How & Co. Could I ask, um, Frankie, please, to um, turn up page, uh, paragraph 59 of your witness statement, and uh, um, that'll come up on the screen. Um, that's at pages 19 to 20 of your statement. It's there. If we could just expand that at paragraph 59. Now, this is in, re in respect of Horizon Project 
achievability. And um, um, you say that in 2001, your confidence in achievability was supported by a statement that the chief executive officer of post office made um, to the effect that the, that, that the project had been a success and that we've got a product which is working extremely well. Now, um, we, as I've said, represent 153 sub-postmasters and mistresses, most of whom, uh, if not all, have given evidence to the effect that the product routinely created unexplained and erroneous shortfalls, more than occasional mismatches, for which they'd been held liable. Now, um, my question is, do you accept that there is a disconnect between what the contracting parties were saying at this time and what was actually happening on the ground? Well, with the benefit of hindsight, and I, I don't know the timelines of your, your um, clients' um, uh, events, um, with the benefit of hindsight, clearly all was not well. But I've been trying to say throughout that we cautioned the post office that this would not be 100% foolproof. And um, have you listened, Mr. Oppenheim, to what our clients and other people have, have said in their evidence in this inquiry from February to May this I year? I have listened to some of the, the, uh, the, the videos, yes. And uh, my next question for you is, with hindsight, do you, do you now agree that Post Office and, Path and uh, ICL's confidence in the product was misplaced at the time that this statement was made? Uh, Th that presumes that we thought everything in the garden was rosy, and we knew it wasn't. Okay. And we knew that there were things that we didn't know about it. And the point that I made elsewhere in my uh, witness statement was that with any new program, you have to look out for the things that you don't know about. You can't pick it all up in testing. So at some point, you have to pull the lever and go live. And bearing in mind the volumes, looking at it from that standpoint, from any IT program, normal IT program standpoint, I'd have said this would have been viewed as a success, except for the fact that, that your clients were, were held to account for things that they didn't do. Yeah. Well, I accept that. And you said that you can't um, uh, identify everything in testing. But, but what did they know about the potential for all these shortfalls that were unexplained? Well... I can't answer that. Um, I mean, the, the, I'd turn it around and say, why didn't the post office and also Pathway note the feedback that was coming back better through the help desk, through the reports of problems back into the help desk? Okay. Well, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, my, next, um, my next questions are in relation to perceived risks prior to rollout. And Frankie, if we could ask for paragraphs 60 and 62 of Mr. Oppenheim's statement, and they are at pages 20 and 21 of 97. So looking then at page, at paragraph 62 point, uh, paragraph 60, these are the, the perceived risks of ICL pathway. And the first one is, um, six, that I wish to refer you to is 60.2, the rollout to 18,500 post offices on the other, sustaining the flow of preparation work, ISDN provisioning, training and equipment supply over almost two years with few breaks. So that was one of Pathways Perceived Risks. At this yes, point. it was. And then moving um, uh, over to um, the uh, post office perceived risks, which is at paragraph 62. If we could move on to that, please, Frankie. So 62.1, rolling out to 40,000 sets of counter equipment um, to 18,500 post office branches at a rate of hundreds a week, having first connected each branch to the network via ISDN or otherwise satellite. Modifying the branches to accept the installation of PCs and printers, given the um, state of technology at the time. And then finally training uh, 67,000 sub-postmasters and counter staff just before their respective implementation dates. Um, our clients say that the training they received was ineffective and that there were significant problems when the uh, equipment was installed, uh, quite often um, major power outages. 
Do you agree, Mr Oppenheim, that these particular risks, and I'm talking about installation and training, were not adequately mitigated? Well, uh, <clears throat> the evidence would suggest not, uh, particularly around training. I think there's definitely something you just said about training, and training was one of the AIs, was it 218 or 298? Um, no, 218. Um, it was, I th as I recall, a two-and-a-half-day training exercise, and then there was an extra half-day or day for the postmaster. Um, a very complex system, a complete change in business practice from, for, for most of them, from from manual paper-based to system. Um, you know, was that enough? I think probably not. And I've seen that post office actually had some of their people and indeed some of the, the more IT literate postmasters help others to augment the training. So I think I think the, the evidence is incontrovertible that, that it wasn't enough. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm just going to ask those who instruct me if they have any more questions they would like me to ask. Thank you. I don't have any further questions for you. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Hello. It's um, Flora Page here, Hi. representing a number of sub-postmasters as well. And what I'd like to do, if I may, is ask some questions relating to the issue that we've come to speak about as remote access. In other words, the capacity for Fujitsu to go into accounts and make changes, and, um, and the extent to which the post office would have known about that. Um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is refer you to poll 000 89779. And this is um, a document from 2000, an internal audit plan. Uh, you can see you're on the distribution list there. And um, this sort of sets out a series of internal audits for ICL to conduct over the, during the year 2000. Um, I don't know if you've been shown this lately or not. Well, if you take me to the bits that you want to talk about, I'll... Certainly. Well, um, if we go to page <coughs> four... Excuse me. And we look at paragraph one. It explains that uh, there is actually a contractual right for Pockel to do audits on ICL. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And it also explains that uh, the the plan here. If we look at uh, little c, um, it says there that the independent audit capability within ICL pathway as a service to management is the one thing. But on the other hand, there's this idea that there's the POCL internal audit. And it seems to be suggesting there, and, and you can read it for yourself, it seems to be suggesting that the plan would be for these ICL audits to be something which the POCL audit could trust, potentially. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's entirely fair. And so it sort of anticipates, does it, that the ICL internal audits will be shared with POCL and their audit team would be able to review them and hopefully trust them and rely upon them? That's the logic. Well, um, if we could then have a look at page six, and it's right down the bottom of the page. Uh, there's a paragraph 5.10, and um, it's sort of at the bottom of that page, and it goes over to the next page. So if we just stay there. Uh, this refers to an audit of the SSC. And is it right that SSC is another way of referring to third-line support? I think that's fair. So this is a, a, a planned um, audit for SSC, or third-line support, and, and I'll just read out what it says here. It says, this is a particularly sensitive area of customer services with unprecedented access to live systems for support purposes. Previous audits have identified potential control weaknesses which management declare have been addressed. 
Uh, the audit will confirm the current arrangements and assess the strength of the controls in place. Uh, will include a site security audit. So if we can just sort of unpack that a little, uh, there's obviously been some concerns about who has the sort of wider access that you get if you're in third line support. Is that fair? It's, um, it's an issue, it's a worry for any program uh, where you have to determine who's trusted to make changes and have access to live systems. And it should be. And it's an obvious area for any um, audit to, to focus on. Now, this said that there had been concerned, concerns and potential control weaknesses. I mean, this was... This, is this, in was, this was in July 2000. That's right. Uh, I would say by then uh, we should have got on top of those. Uh, this says um, that they have been addressed according to management. Yes. It doesn't. I'm just reading it as it as it as it is written. It doesn't say that they've audited and verified or confirmed that it has. No. Well. It well, says the audit will confirm the current arrangements and assess the strength of the controls in place. I. Seeing that, as I imagine I would have seen it originally, I wouldn't have been unduly alarmed by that because it's right that they should be looking and worrying about these, and I would too. And it would suggest that there have been some weaknesses. Management says they've addressed them. The audit will follow up. It sounds okay to me. Uh, I, I, I don't seek to suggest otherwise. This is a, this is a planned yeah. audit. Yeah. I haven't been able to locate the documentation of the actual audit, so so it's unclear what was found when this was followed up. But the point that I'd like to, to sort of tease out, if I may, is that assuming that audit took place, post office would have, according to the plan, then been shown that and, and it would have been shared with them for their own audit purposes. Is that is that well, right? I'm afraid I don't know. Um, the fact that they could rely on an internal audit, I, I don't know that... I wasn't responsible for this. This is Martin Bennett's area. I don't know whether he would routinely have shared these with POCL, particularly in the early days, or whether the intention was that POCL would say, look, can you have you done an audit on X, and would you share it with me? In other words, we would produce it if asked, as opposed to just issuing them all to POCL without um, being asked. I, I suspect it was, if asked, we'd share it, as opposed to here it is, to be honest. The um, only way to resolve any problems that ICL picked up uh, in terms of accounts and reconciliations, um, the problems that we've been talking about with acceptance incidents 376 was through SSC going into the accounts and doing these changes. Is that fair? Uh, no. Um, there was such a spectrum. There's Appendix 4, Schedule 4 in the third supplemental agreement. It goes through a long list. For, for the kind of problems of breaks and such like that I was referring to latterly, yes. Um, if the postmaster wasn't able to do it for himself under instruction, under guidance. Uh, there was another whole category where a lot of the 376 discrepancies were uh, going to be not automated, but semi-automated and didn't affect, didn't, there wasn't a cash account error, but or some other missing transaction or whatever error. So, so some, but not all by any means, I think is the answer. Um, and where uh, it was required, th th those general provisions at the, right at the end of the third supplemental agreement require Fujitsu to inform Pockle if we made a judgment. And that was really key to me, because then it's saying, look, we're really not sure 
And if then someone is, is accused of fraud, that would be a first place to look. We would have provided that information. If he had made a, a call on such and such a day, which tied in with that discrepancy for that week's cash account, then that's at least a starting point for saying, just a minute, we knew there was a problem here. This is the assumption we made. Maybe that was a wrong assumption. We should relook at it. But is it, is it at a more routine level, when it wasn't that sort of uh, we're not sure type situation, um, somebody at SSC would go in and resolve the problem? I was not expecting that. Um, I, I, for me, this was, this was um, more of a technical support thing as opposed to changing data. We, I did not expect any change of data, particularly without the agreement of the postmaster. So if the postmaster had been talked through a correction routine and it hadn't worked, then I would have expected the help desk to have said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise an error report. I'm going to declare it to the post office, and I'm going to make these changes, and I'll share them with you. Is that OK? Right? They agree what, what the, the corrective action should be, and he does it on the postmaster's behalf. That's what I expect. Not that he would do it unilaterally. Now, I, I have no direct knowledge of what was actually done, I'm afraid. Have but you, that, was, that was my expectation. Have you read the evidence of Richard Roll at all? I have, um, briefly. And I, I, I didn't know Richard. Um, and I, I found some of what he said um, well, a lot of what he said concerning, but I also found some of it quite surprising. I wasn't... I, I, I should stop that. Uh, you accept, don't you, that Horizon data was not infallible? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've said that all along. And that the post office should not have prosecuted on the basis that it was? You're asking me for an opinion. Um, would I have done it? No not without digging really deep. Finally, do you accept that it was actually in Fujitsu's commercial interests for post office to prosecute on that basis? No, I don't accept that at all. I, I, I mean, it, quite apart from the moral side of things, I don't understand how even commercially... Oh, you mean to keep in their good books? No, 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 no. Fujitsu is not that kind of organisation. Not in my day, anyway. Thank you. Those are my questions. And, sir, may I ask some questions now? Yes, of course. Thank you, sir. Can you, can, uh, I know by that answer you can hear me. Can you see me, sir? There's always a delay, but now I can, Mr Maloney. Thank you very yeah. much, sir. And um, Mr Oppenheim, um, um, the... the the chair has just given you my surname. My, my, I'm Tim Maloney, and I also represent a, a number of sub-postmasters. And specifically, um, I, I act on behalf of sub-postmasters whose convictions have been quashed for in referral of their convictions either to the Court of Appeal or to the Crown Court. Understood. I've only a very few questions, really, for you, and, and they concern commercial priorities of POCO, as you understood them. Um, when dealing with um, the development of Horizon in 1999, particularly. And, and firstly, did you regard the benefit agency's cancellation of the benefits payment card in May 1999 as an existential threat to Pockle? Uh, yes. Why did you regard it as such an existential threat to Pockle, Mr Oppenheim? Because the original plan, the raison d'etre for the benefit payment card, was to modernise the method of payment through the post office to claimants and to um, make it, a, a quote unquote, a good experience for them to continue, continue to do so. Whereas what the benefits agency would have preferred was ACT. And, and they actually made no, no, um, uh, you know, secret of that. So that would have eliminated, at its worst, something like a third, as I recall, of Pockle's revenues. Mm. 
So in that sense, yes, it was an existential threat. Unless something could be done to to mitigate that loss, and hence the, the network banking solution and and also OBCS was, was an aid in the meantime because it, it cut down on encashment fraud, even with paper, and it stopped the benefits agency from rushing to ACT, which otherwise I think they would have wanted to do. Whether the government would have allowed them to do that or not, I don't know. So there was a necessity to generate alternative revenue streams. Yes. And those alternative revenue streams included network banking. Yes. And OBCS. Uh, not really. OBCS was, in a sense, a, um, uh, an interim solution. Mm -hmm. It was a way of making the old books secure by putting a barcode on them such that BA could put a stop notice mm -hmm. on them, which previously they couldn't have done. Mm -hmm. And that saved variously estimated 50 million of, of the 150 million loss of, trans, of um, encashment forward per annum. So it was a good step towards the way. Uh, but no, that was part of the legacy of books, and that was going to go away. Um, and what needed to replace it was network banking to attract as many uh, POCL customers to continue to use branches and maintain the footfall. <clears throat> and of course, integral to the movement to network banking would be the development of automation. Yes. Without automation, there could be mo no movement there. There could be no alternative revenue streams. The existential threat perhaps became an existential reality. Well, it, it would have been, yes. And so was it obvious to you around 1999 and into 2000 that Pockle would be under real commercial pressure if um, Horizon did not proceed at pace? Yes. That's all I ask. Thank you, Mr. Oppenheim. Is there anyone else present who wishes to ask Mr. Oppenheim any questions? Uh, no, that's a nil return. Um, thank you, sir. Right. Well, I'm going to go on a little fishing expedition with Mr. Oppenheim myself, just for a minute or two. And Mr. Oppenheim, it relates to many questions you've been asked about um, processes whereby um, Pathway might provide information to Pockle to assist in investigating sub-postmasters, all right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to discuss the con strict contractual provisions with you. I'm going on what I describe as a fishing ex expedition because I want to try and identify the people who might know most about this in order to ask questions in the future. Do you understand? I do. And will you accept from me, because I've got reliable evidence to this effect, that investigations of sub-postmasters in reliance on Horizon data began almost as soon as the rollout began, because we have instances of people being in court in 2001 and therefore being investigated in 2000, all right? So in the year 2000, if I was... Um, the person in Pockle who was charged with accumulating the evidence necessary to investigate whether a sub-postmaster had committed a crime. I think it's reasonably obvious that I'd have to go to someone in Fujitsu to ask for relevant information. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Now, I'm not one of the people who are working in the technical teams. I'm now a post office investigator, or perhaps even a post office lawyer. So I want to locate the right people, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So can you assist me from your knowledge, because in this period you obviously were very knowledgeable, who would it be that would most likely tell me what information Fujitsu might hold, sorry, Pathway might hold, 
and how I might use it. Uh, I firstly, I don't know the answer, I'm, but I'm going to try and give you my best shot. Um, I mean, the information is all operational information, so that comes under the head of services, Steve Muckow. But he's a support function. So su support is, a, by definition, a support function. He's not necessarily the, pers the go-to person from within Pockle. As I've said before, um, my working assumption was anything to do with, with prosecutions to do with audit would have been Martin Bennett within right. ICL Pathway. Um, so that would be, I'd have thought, my headline go-to person. And then he would go to someone in support, third-line support, Stephen Muckow. I'm thinking maybe the, the very first of these that would be groundbreaking, so probably Steve Muckow, to get the evidence to produce the information that was sought. So my investigation begins with Mr. Bennett, and we can ha ask him what he would have done in my uh, supposed scenario. Yeah, I, I would definitely put the question to him. I, I may be wrong in, um, you know, pointing at him, but logically, I would have thought that was where it would go. All right. It could have come up through, just depending on how POCL raised the matter. Did it go from there? prosecution team, their fraud team, to say Keith Baines as the, the sort of interface to me contractually, who might then have gone to Steve Muckow without my knowing it. I'd so Mr. Surprised. Baines is another possibility for asking these questions? Well, I, I think, I think that's not going to be possible. No, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but, All right. But one, um, of, one, of, one of that group of people I would have thought would know, because why wouldn't they go to them first to say, have you got any data, operational data, that would help us with this, before necessarily coming to us? But I don't know. All right. And I can't be certain about this yet, um, but no doubt I will get evidence about it. It may be that in that same period, there, wa there would have been uh, a request, as Mr. Beer was uh, putting to you, for a person to give evidence from Pathway about the reliability of Horizon. Uh, who would have been involved in making the decision as to who is best placed to give that sort of evidence, given these two premises? Firstly, it would be in the nature of expert evidence uh, where the expert owes duties to the court. But secondly, also, it would be based to a degree on factual evidence. So you would need a suitable person to cover those two things uh, in the pathway organization. Who would have made the decision, it's Mr. X or Ms. Y, who's the best place? Could I suggest you ask John Bennett that question? Right. Um, I would have thought this this would have been seen as such a a major issue that it would have any such question would have gone to John for determination. I, I don't recall discussing it with him, um, but that may be a lapse of memory on my part. Because on any viewpoint, there did come a point in time where the person given evidence in court about these issues was being challenged about it. So it's hard to believe that this wasn't, at least by that, that stage, though I appreciate this might be after you were direct involvement, there wouldn't have been a good deal of discussion about uh, this sort of evidence. I mean, again, at the risk of repetition, it, it, it never came up, never came across my desk. I cannot believe I would have forgotten had it done so during my tenure. Mm. Now, the fact that it only came to court 2001, that could point to it's having been discussed after, just after, probably, I'd left in February. It's possible. Um, but I'm, I'm casting around. I'm sorry, I just don't know. All right, then I'll leave my fishing rod aside. 
and uh, we'll wait for future witnesses. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Oppenheim, for making your statement and for giving evidence to the inquiry. You're welcome. I hope it helps. So thank you. That's um, all of the evidence for today. We're back at 10am um, tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Beer. Thank you. Good night.